so welcome everybody uh, to my talk. Um, we actually, I meant to ask Adrian and Julie beforehand, uh, but the time slot we have is uh, 30 minutes in total and then we have a break afterwards. Um, so if we overrun slightly by the break, that's not an issue from a timing perspective, but obviously it means that people can't take a break if they wanted to, so um, cool. Uh, the reason I mention that is that this is actually intended as a keynote talk of an hour. Um, and so I've had to cut a bunch of slides and edit it down. Uh, and it's the first time I'm doing it as a 30 minute version. Uh, so I should probably keep the preamble short, but uh, anyway, uh, it might go a little bit longer or I might just skip some slides towards the end and we'll see because the more important stuff I put at the beginning. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. Anyway, cool. So the, the talk is titled Business Agility Through the Lenses of Systems, Science and Sapiens. Um, and I'm just gonna basically jump straight into it with a little bit of a, a sort of a background. Uh, for those of you who can see this picture, uh, how many of you know where this is? Does anybody know where this is? See, Daniel knows where this is. Where is this, Daniel? Uh, South Africa, that's Tabletop Mountain, but I forgot the name of the city now. <laughs> it is Cape Town, in fact, uh, yes. So uh, this, this wonderful place is actually where I'm from originally. Uh, I, I no longer live there, but it's where I grew up uh, and where I started my journey uh, with Agile and learning and all sorts of things. If you, if you ever have the opportunity to visit this wonderful city, uh, I highly recommend it. It's, it's quite beautiful, as you can see. Um, the, the wine is also very cheap and very good, which is also uh, quite helpful in persuading people. Um, anyway, so I was hanging out here doing a bunch of things. Uh, and the next thing I know, I was meeting some folks uh, and they invited me uh, to come and hang out uh, in this city. Does anybody know where this is? Maybe you can guess a general area Sweden. or a region. Sweden. 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 You are correct. This is Stockholm, yeah. Sweden. Uh, yeah. So, as I say, I was hanging out previously uh, in Cape Town, uh, and then I met a couple of folks from Spotify and was offered the opportunity to come and hang out in the cold and darkness uh, and spend uh, basically, well, it's now been six years uh, that I've been here. Uh, I have since moved on from Spotify and I'm, I'm doing my own thing. Um, but that's just a little bit of a background of me and my journey of sort of how I came to be uh, standing, well, I guess, virtually in front of you uh, doing this talk today. Um, before I get into sort of the, the nuts and bolts of the talk, I want to tell you a little bit of a story. Um, and so I'm going to tell you a story about chicken. Uh, and hopefully we don't have too many vegetarians in the audience because otherwise I get funny faces. Um, but imagine a, a young kid. And for those of you who have kids, maybe not so hard to imagine. Uh, kids have a wonderful way of asking questions. And for those of you who have kids, you would know that one of the most common questions that they like to ask is, why? So, two parents busy cooking some dinner. They put a chicken in the oven. And just before they put the chicken in the oven, they cut a little bit off the top and the bottom of the chicken, stick it in the oven. Kid watches this and goes, hmm, something's interesting about this. Why do you do that? Parents look at each other and they say, I have no idea. I learned this from my parents. So. A couple of days later, they go and they ask the, the parents and they find out that they also do not know. They learned from their parents. So fast forward a few weeks, they go and visit the grandparents uh, and they find out that it turns out that basically what happened was, as the grandmother explains to them, my dear, when we got married, we didn't have so much money. The reason we were cutting a bit of the top and the bottom of the chicken was because we couldn't afford a very big oven and thus a very big pan. And therefore the only way to get the chicken in the oven was to cut a small piece off it and thus get it in the oven. Now, the reason I tell the story is because I think very often what happens is we find people uh, look at other companies, we look at other organizations, we look at other people and we say they have something that I want and we copy and we paste what they've done. Uh, and very often when we dig into the story behind it, we find out that it might be a little bit like this chicken. Uh, they don't necessarily know the reason why they were doing it either. Uh, and in many cases, the actual motivations maybe don't apply to our current context. So for example, if you're hanging out at a company consulting like I do, uh, and you find out, um, you talk to the CEO of the company, probably the oven gets described like this. If your oven is big and shiny and fancy, maybe you don't need to be cutting bits off the chicken. Uh, could be an idea. However, when we look at the chicken, very often what happens is if we're describing our oven, uh, the CEO and some of the senior executives and those who are quite proud of the company will probably describe it like this. But when we actually take a little bit of a closer look, often what we find is maybe we're doing a little bit more like this, yeah? So we're in a slightly different scenario. Our perception 
and the reality are often a little bit misaligned. So what I want you to do is keep this a little bit in mind as we do the talk, uh, this idea of the chicken about not necessarily copying and pasting things verbatim, uh, but just that we have to kind of think a little bit before we take things and borrow from other companies, uh, because maybe they're not necessarily fitting us in the way that we thought. So if we want to move beyond copy paste, how would we do this? And I, I want to take you through a little bit of a story uh, through three lenses. And the three lenses that I talk about here are sapiens, science, and systems. Uh, sapiens being the human side, uh, science being how we validate whether the things we're doing are working or not. And systems is basically how the parts all fit together uh, and how things interact. Cool. So if you're all ready, we can start with the actual content and rather not the preamble. So sapiens, how many of you heard this saying before? Uh, but people resist change. Maybe you just show a hand or you can use the zoom icon to, to so I think a lot of people have heard this. Maybe you've even said it. Uh, I've certainly been responsible for my fair share of encountering this uh, statement in the past. Uh, there's another version of this that I've heard. It's the or people won't work unless we tell them what to do or what to work on or how to do it. Have you heard this version as well, perhaps? Yeah, some nodding one or two hands. Cool. So the challenge I find with this is that basically the assumption that I think underlies this is that essentially we have people in the company who are not suited from a skills perspective or a capability perspective. And essentially this brings a metaphor of dead wood inside the company. And the challenge I have with the statement is that if you have dead wood inside your company, there's really only two ways that it got there. Either you hired dead wood or you hired live wood and killed it, right? And what I want to frame for you in this context of the sapiens part of my talk is how do we stop killing the wood that is alive when we hire it? I can't help you solve the immediate challenge of not hiring dead wood, but if you're hiring live wood and killing it, maybe this talk will help a little bit. So let's start at the beginning. Usually when we talk about business and strategy, a lot of what we talk about is kind of framed in a metaphor of chess. It's sort of war and chess and domination and winning. And part of the challenge with this is I think that the metaphor is actually not very fit for purpose. Whereas if we think about it in a slightly different way, what I think is perhaps a slightly better metaphor is more like this. It's gardening, right? You can shine the right light, you can plant in the right season, you can give just enough water, but if you give too much, it's a problem, right? If you plant too early or too late, you have a problem. If you plant at just the right season, you get a fantastic crop. That metaphor of nurturing and tending to a garden that's more really how we want to be dealing with people, um, much more than say chess or some sort of machine models. So who can tell me what's going on here? Does anybody have an idea what's happening in this picture? Maybe you've been in a meeting room that looks a little bit like this before. Any ideas? Well, there's only one person with Coke on the table, so. <laughs> so the, the guy in the middle with his hands sort of pointed forward like this, that is Mike Pence, the Vice President of the United States. Uh, and believe it or not, this is Donald Trump's Council on Women's Rights. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but I kind of look at this and I go, there is absolutely no possible way that this group could possibly make a good decision on women's rights, given the representation in the room, right? It's just clearly not going to work. But we do this in our companies. We have a group of people who look a little bit like this. Uh, as I heard somebody jokingly refer to the other day as uh, pale, male, and stale. Um, basically just hanging out, um, you know, bunch of old folks, nothing against old people, but if those are the only people in the room, eh, maybe you have a challenge, right? How about this picture? Could you tell me what's going on here? Anybody know? So the first time I saw this picture, I must be honest, I did not get the right answer. I was thinking something along the lines of, yeah, maybe it's a family reunion or it's a wedding or it's something like this. Um, if you look in the background, you'll see photos that look a little bit like space or some sort of thing. This is actually the Indian mission to Mars. They've just successfully launched a satellite into space that is going to arrive in Mars. They were the only country ever to do this on the first attempt. And they did it at a budget of a tenth of what anyone else in the world has done it before or since. Quite an accomplishment. But when we look at a picture like this, we don't immediately look at a bunch of Indian women in this sort of a context and make the assumption that they're really smart scientists, right? So I want to tell you a little bit of a story about why this is. 
millions of years ago, uh, or maybe not so many millions of years ago for some of us, uh, but certainly back in the history, uh, we would be wandering around on the plain somewhere. Uh, one of these would jump out from behind a bush and it would start running towards us, you know, trying to make us into dinner. Uh, the challenge is if we sort of sit there and we go, hmm, it's yellow, it's moving quite fast, it's licking its lips, it looks fairly hungry, it's definitely coming in my direction. I'm not sure what it is. By this point, you're already lunch, yeah? And this is not so helpful. So what we had to do is we had to learn and we evolved this ability to make snap judgments. We think fast and we see something, we make a first pattern match and we make an assessment and we go. And that's exactly the same thing that leads us to ending up with the meeting room that I showed you in the first scenario and to looking at the Indian women and thinking maybe they're not scientists, right? Now, there's some good news behind this, which I'll come to in a minute, but I think it's important to acknowledge that we all have bias and this is a challenge. And if we want to try to address this, there's a nice ca catchphrase that I picked up along the way that I think is quite helpful. What we want to try to do is if we want to balance out our ability to see more of the whole and to have better perception of what is happening in reality, we need to have both diversity of perspective and of people as well as inclusion so that those folks can feel that they are part of the discussion and can contribute meaningfully. Another way to think of this is diversity is being invited to the party and inclusion is choosing the music. We need to have both of these two to balance out each other, not just one or the other. So if you have this kind of a situation, fairly straightforward, you can fix your diversity, but what about if you're trying to solve the challenge of inclusion, right? I think something we need to talk about in this space is this concept of safety. Too often, when we talk about safety, uh, we talk about it in this kind of a way. There's some sort of post hoc, you know, thing where we say, oh, well, you weren't listening, I just said don't fail, right? And this to me, not really safety. I don't think so, right? Uh, and if you have a scenario where maybe meeting a leader feels a little bit like being the kid on the right-hand side, uh, a little bit overwhelming, maybe making suggestions, uh, running a retrospective, something along these lines, a restructure in your company, all of these scenarios. And one of my personal favorites is performance reviews. If you feel like that kid on the right, or as the manager, you feel like the person on the left, that means you have some work to do. So what we want to try to do to address this is to create safety to fail, specifically for shipping and for sapiens. So on the human side, we need to feel safe to be able to contribute and to bring our ideas forward because otherwise we simply won't. But we also need to be able to try stuff in a technological sense or in a business or product sense, uh, you know, and know that we're not going to get fired because we made some innocent little mistake along the way. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we could do this and just give you a few examples. This is a big broad topic that I cannot completely solve, unfortunately, uh, within the time that we have available or even within a couple of days. Um, so I'll give you some recommended reading and stuff for later on. But I think one of the ways to do this is to intentionally design around our exclusionary biases. So I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of things that I've, I've done in my personal experience uh, and that I've seen work at various companies. First one, an anonymous CV screen. We actually tried this at Spotify. We removed the names from the CVs. The hypothesis was if we couldn't tell whether the person was male or female or white or African or where they came from or any of their background, we would select them through the recruitment process at a higher rate, right? And it turns out this was true. It wasn't particularly hard to remove the names. Uh, we also experimented with removing the universities, the previous companies they'd worked at, these kind of things. They all had an effect in different ways. I would encourage you, if this sounds interesting, give it a try, experiment with it in your context, right? Another example of this. How often have you showed up at a meeting where you get some very complicated plan uh, presented to you and at the end of the meeting, the person goes, right, any questions? They give you about four and a half milliseconds to say, wait, 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 and nobody says anything. They go, cool, thanks very much, and the meeting's over, right? We don't give people any kind of pre-reading. We don't give them time to think. And what that does is that biases generally towards those who are more comfortable with making snap judgments and probably also towards those who are extroverted versus introverted. If you want to balance for this, you need to consider the fact that there are a variety of different methods that people will evaluate information and give them time to approach it in different ways. Write your idea down, simply send the slide deck down in, in advance, give them some time to think and come and have a chat with them tomorrow. Something like this can make a huge difference. Third example I want to give you on this, uh, this is an example of an agenda uh, that we used to use for a check-in 
Um, so VP of engineering checking in with the director of engineering and then director checking in with the product management team for the, the, the team themselves. Um, we would use a similar agenda format. Uh, I want to draw your attention specifically to the last three. So the last three is basically, we were asking people to say, well, what is on your minds? What are you stressed by? And very importantly, which of those do you actually need help with? Because what we'd noticed was a very strong tendency, especially for senior leaders, to assume that if you were saying something was a problem, you needed help. And that was not always the case. Very often, I'm thinking about this thing, I have a challenge or a problem, but I got it. You know, If I need help, I'll let you know. And so separating those things out. And also what you will find interesting is very often the way in which people ask for help and what they want your help with is not the thing you would have thought of doing the first time around. I don't need you to help me by fixing the problem directly. What I want you to do is go and butter up that other person so that they're open to the idea and then I'll talk to them afterwards, for example. Many, many different things. Cool. So to recap this part on sapiens, and I apologize for moving a lot faster than I normally do on this, but basically what we need to try to create if we want to actually improve our ability to be agile at a full scale business level, we need to first address safety to fail whether we succeed or try. We need to be safe to try, yeah? Secondly, we need to acknowledge and design intentionally around our biases. Step one, happy so far? Cool. If you'd like to read more, uh, there are three books that I can recommend. Uh, I can make the slides available afterwards, but feel free to take a screenshot or something like that. Um, the three books that I recommend here, Esther Derby's wonderful new book, uh, Seven Rules for Productive, a positive productive change. I always get that title muddled. Um, powerful. It's the story of the creation of Netflix's culture. Really, really quite fascinating story. Uh, and the last one is super helpful for understanding how humans work and how we think. You might even learn a few things about how you think yourself. Uh, Jonathan Haidt, um, The Righteous Mind. Really, really fascinating reading. Cool. So let's talk about using the science. This is the second step. So very often uh, when we start out with doing things, we end up in a situation, maybe not by our own intention, uh, but very often what happens is we end up, we've developed all of the side effects uh, and none of the actual cures. Uh, I've seen this so many times, especially in a change initiative type scenario. And part of the challenge with this is that it's really hard to know what works. It's also really hard to know in advance. It's even harder, in fact. And so what we want to try to do is we want to get better at understanding at least a little bit so that we can learn and I'll talk to you a little bit about how that works. So one of the challenges that we have is we tend to do all of these kind of extrapolations and we tend to look at anecdotal data points and say, oh, well, therefore this thing or this thing happened, therefore something unrelated happened. And if you look at the cartoon, uh, he's talking about an example here where, you know, you had one husband, zero husbands the day before, one husband today, therefore in the future, you're gonna have dozens of husbands. Of course, it's absurd. I mean, that's, that's just, you know, not going to happen. And this is the challenge of something that we do. But we do it in ways like this. Very often when I see us doing prioritization in the company, uh, I call the spreadsheet voodoo. I don't know if any of you have seen this before, but, um, you know, we, we rank something out of importance out of B, C, A, B, E, something like this. Uh, we put an effort that we've pulled out of our ear between a one and a four. Uh, we round it up because we know everybody you know, takes longer in reality than we thought. We put an urgency number, we multiply it by something, we sprinkle a little bit of something else on top, we come out with a magic number that's supposed to tell us the order of the sequence. I don't know how many of you are familiar with South Park, but there's a, a wonderful story in there about the underpants gnome. Um, and their basic philosophy in life was that we're going to collect underpants, magic step two, dot, 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 and then profit. And it's become a little bit of a meme on the internet. And I think that a lot of what we do as prioritization inside of business actually sounds quite similar to this underpants gnome. And I know people get a little bit upset when I say this, uh, but that, that is unfortunately the reality. So what can we do about it? Well, I think there's a few important things to take into account. The first is that this book, I, I will link again later on, uh, but Annie Duke uh, won the World Series of Poker. She's a brilliant poker player, wrote this fantastic book. If you're just introducing yourself to probabilistic thinking, it's a fantastic place to start. If you know a lot about this topic already, probably skip the book because it is a bit more introductory, but it is very accessible and got some wonderful stories. But basically, what she talks about is this challenge of what we do as humans is that we tend to evaluate the outcome of a decision as good or bad based on the result rather than the data that went into it, if that makes sense. 
So we assess something. We play a hand of poker and we win. Therefore, we think we're smart and we're good poker players when in actual fact, we were just lucky, right? And we do this. And the challenge is that we then miss the opportunity to learn and we start to think that we're something that we maybe aren't and we miss the opportunity to actually become a really great poker player. The other part of this, and I referenced this book earlier already, uh, in The Righteous Mind, he describes this concept where basically the human mind is a story processor. And what you find is that we basically come up with, we make decisions by our intuition first, and that we construct a reason to explain the, re the, the decision that we've made afterwards. And this is fine, knowing that we do this. Uh, but we want to be able to at least understand this and use this to our advantage. I'm going to skip that. So what I want to suggest that we do in this situation is to write down and quantify our hypothesis before we start. If we do this thing, what in outcome or impact are we expecting to see? Just write it down. And then when you've done the thing or as you're doing the thing, reflect on that and say, is that still the outcome that we wanted? Does this still make sense? Okay. The reflection piece of this is really important. A practical example of this would be to use a concept like cost of delay, which some of you may have come across already. Essentially, if you think about it, if we had this feature, this functionality, this process, these people today, what would the monthly benefit be? If you can quantify it in dollars or money, that is quite helpful. But simply say, how many customers would be affected by this? How often, how much money is made? How much money is saved? Something like this. These are the questions that you can start to ask that will help you to answer this question. Cool. And of course, at the end of all of this, you need to have some feedback loops. So writing down the hypothesis, you want to test it with some other people. You can test it both when you create the hypothesis, but also as you're going. You'll be amazed how much you can learn by evaluating the difference between what you thought was going to happen before you started and what happened in reality, right? But we do this thing where we, when we look back, we tend to imagine the past was different, you know? We were successful and we think that was by our intention uh, rather than just getting lucky. You'll be amazed how often what you thought happened and what really happened is quite different. The second thing that I think we can do in this space is to, to do what I call sequence your focus or to put it in a heuristic sense, don't let number three block number one. Uh, and for some reason I have the slide twice. Um, <laughs> To give you a practical example, this is a, a, a tribe at Spotify uh, working together, and I want to draw your attention uh, to the right-hand side. This is about 80, 8,500 people working together um, in flight levels terminology, if you're familiar with this, which I'll touch on in a second. Uh, this is a level two board uh, visualizing a program of work across multiple squads. Um, so on the right-hand side, we have the current bets. These are the six things that we are working on at a high level. And the idea is that if you're working on number one, you shouldn't be interrupted by people working on number three, but if you do need the help from people on number three, you should be able to ask them for assistance. Similarly, the converse of that is also true. So yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense, but then be amazed how often I see companies doing this thing where they say, here are the top things that are all number one priority. And here are the next set of things, 15 things that are number two and 16 things that are number three. We need to actually sequence it because otherwise we haven't actually made the trade off. Cool. So to summarize this point of sapiens, two key, uh, not sapiens, sorry, on science, two key things that I think we can do. Quantify our hypotheses, write them down before we start, evaluate them when we're done. And secondly, focus. Sequence the focus. Don't let number three block number one. Cool. If you're interested to learn more about these kind of concepts, uh, three books that I can recommend. I already mentioned uh, Annie Duke's Thinking in Bets. Um, focuses more on product and product strategy, but Melissa Perry's Escaping the Build Trap is a fantastic book uh, if you're getting into product management or trying to think about decision making at a company level. Uh, really great insights on how you can build a strategy and strategy deployment organization. Uh, and if you want to take the masterclass, uh, the ever wonderful Donald Reinertsen, uh, this is probably one of the dense, densest books in terms of conceptual information I've ever read in my life. It's probably about 18 books in 250 pages. Um, I highly, highly recommend it, but I would read the other one first and then move on to Don Reinertsen. Uh, but if you find it interesting, uh, these are all wonderful books. Cool. So now we need to talk about systems, the third lens. So how do the parts interact? So we know a little bit about the humans. We're able to sense some sense of 
what's going on because we're taking into account multiple perspectives. We're able to now a little bit evaluate what's working and what's not, but we need to look at how the parts are working together because ultimately that's what affects our ability to perform as a company. So I'll give you an example. Uh, and credit to Klaus Leopold for these. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, the Flight Levels Academy, which is the company we founded together, um, it, we've been talking about and, and helping companies with this concept for a while. Um, so if you saw his uh, opening keynote, uh, what was it, yesterday? Um, I was thinking it was this morning, but if you saw it yesterday, uh, he talked about some of the concepts that are related to this in a little bit more detail. But to give you an example, we have a typical team board that looks something like this, right? Uh, backlog next, develop and done. Uh, so in this case, maybe a software team, uh, something along those lines. But I want to draw your attention to this um, kind of flow because what happens is that when we ask, well, when it gets to done, is it done? Like there's that customer value, it's completely finished. And of course, the answer is no. Usually we're waiting for something like integration. And if we dig a little bit further, we find out that there's also maybe a waiting for acceptance and maybe even a waiting for release, right? Now, in different industries, this will be different, but usually what happens is that when my team over here is finished with something, the next team needs to do something else. There isn't usually one person or one team that's involved in delivering value in, to a customer. The other part of the challenge is that we're doing these on a monthly and quarterly basis. Uh, and very often, they're, they're not quite as agile as we would like. But at this point, things are actually done. But if we go the other way, we start to find out that we're actually only looking at the development backlog. And if we go a little bit further, we say, well, what happens before the development backlog? Turns out, well, there's a product backlog and there's some analysis work and a few other things that happen in that space. And if we go a little bit further, we find out that there's even more things that happen upstream. Somebody had to come up with an idea. You'd had to go through a steering committee, some sort of triage process, maybe waiting for approval, these kind of things. When we zoom out, we look at this process and it's quite a long flow, right? What we're at least able to see here is the end turn flow, but what we can tell is that it's maybe not moving so fast because in reality, many of these steps are only happening on a monthly, quarterly or yearly basis. So the end to end flow can be in the order of 36 months as I found in an insurance company I worked with. And they were saying, well, we want to be super, super agile over here, right? What is the point? We go and we be really, really agile and then yay, we're so fucking agile. But at the end of the day, are you delivering anything to your customer? It doesn't necessarily make any difference, right? Part of the challenge with this is that we're focusing on trying to make one tiny piece of the problem faster. We're trying to make the working faster. But in reality, if you look at it, you see the red is where we're waiting and the black dots are where we're actually working. So my question is this, why would we want to speed up the working if waiting is most of the lead time? It doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense to me. However, what I think we can do to, in order to improve here is if we start to visualize and manage the flow end to end. So from idea all the way to delivery, from concept to cash, something like this, yeah? all the way through. So I want to tell you a little bit of an example about how this could possibly be done. So you may have seen some slides similar to this in Klaus's talk, but essentially if you think about the organization as broken up into three levels or comprising of three different layers or three components that fit together. At the bottom, we have operational, where the work gets done. This could be people writing software, it could be people hiring people, it could be people marketing, selling, finance, whatever it is. This is where you know, the operational work actually happens. If you look at the top, we have a strategy. A very common challenge inside an organization is we say, oh, we don't actually have a strategy, but the reality is that usually it's more of a communication challenge. The strategy is there, we just don't hear about it so often. And when we do, eh, it's not so difficult, not so easy to understand. My hypothesis on this is basically that what is missing is actually level two in almost all of these cases. We don't have a way to coordinate multiple teams and to convert strategy into something meaningful at each level. So what we try to do in order to address this is we say, well, multiple teams at level one need to coordinate their activities, could be across departments, across functional areas, across even multiple different companies. They need to work together. So we get them together and we build a board or a visual management system something like level two, right? We say, well, some folks are gonna come and they're gonna attend and we're gonna have some conversations about it. And of course, we want to try to tie it up to the strategy level as well. So at the top level, you might be saying, well, we wanna invest in moving to cloud. Uh, and so that's a major challenge for us. And that would mean a number of things all the way down throughout the organization. Of course, we also need to have some feedback loops. 
Uh, very, very important. Uh, you should be having these for breakfast, lunch, and dinner almost every day. Uh, I highly, highly recommend this. Um, and I want to show you this example. So I showed you this board a little bit earlier on, and I drew your attention to the bets. Um, but as I said before, the bets are actually, these are items that are visualized at level three, right? So these are the bets from the company level. Those are level three strategy items that are being visualized there. If you look at the rest of the board, what you start to see is multiple people. So, so basically what we have is we have about 80 to 100 people being able to have a stand up every day around this board. Uh, at this time, there weren't so many teams underlying this. But basically, we can come together and we can say, as an entire unit of 100 people, what is the most important thing that we should focus on today? And then we go off and we do that. And tomorrow, we come back and we have the same conversation. I could tell you lots more stories about this board. Uh, and I would invite you. I'm going to be available for some Q&A uh, in the flight levels room um, in the booth space uh, after this. And I will be there for about an hour. So drop by and we can chat more in more detail. Uh, but I'll just wrap up kind of the talk from, from here on forwards. Cool. So two things that I think we should do on the system side. First, visualize the end-to-end -end flow. Don't just visualize the team level. Don't focus only on the teams. Make sure that you visualize the end-to-end -end flow of the full value stream. And secondly, interactions across all levels. Make sure that you're connecting people across multiple teams and across the hierarchy. It's not enough to simply say, that team over there is super, super agile. We need to be thinking about the wait times and the queues across the entire organization. Cool. So, Lost my mouse. If you'd like to read some more, uh, two books that I can recommend. Uh, firstly, Thinking in Systems by Donella Meadows. If you're into systems thinking, this is a wonderful primer book. Uh, gives you a great introduction to the concepts. Uh, and of course, um, thinking, Rethinking Agile, uh, which is Klaus's book um, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, if you're interested in the book, uh, there is a discount code available. Uh, you can get, I think it's about 70% off the price of the book. Uh, it, you can also get the discount code by popping via um, the Flight Levels Academy booth. Um, the links are available in the sharing icons and so on. Um, so yeah, if you'd like to read more and learn more about this topic, uh, I can highly recommend this book. Cool. So just to summarize the talk in its entirety, uh, we talked about three things, systems, science, uh, and sapiens. Sapiens, we're talking about increasing situational awareness with improved diversity and inclusion. Yeah. Science, avoiding results and creating focus by using ordered hypotheses and systems. We want to find where to improve by visualizing the end-to-end -end flow and encouraging interactions at all levels. Cool. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's me. Um, looking very serious, uh, but it is me. Um, and if you'd like to come and chat, I mean, I'm happy to hang out here for a little bit longer as well. Uh, but as I said, I will always also be available in the flight levels room. Uh, it's on the right side of the Sokoka room. You can just jump in and uh, pop by and we could chat more and, and discuss any questions that you may have. Um, thank you for coming. <laughs>